Hi, um, good afternoon everyone. So I'm Devarun Kaur and this is Benjamin Ford from USC and this is um, a joint work with uh, Thay Nguyen who is now at University of Michigan and uh, Melinda Ambe from USC and Andrew Plumtree from the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, so as most of you might be aware or have seen in uh, many of the other talks that there has been significant amount of uh, research in trying to protect uh, important infrastructure targets using limited security resources. Um, however, uh, these infrastructure security games are one-shot game models and it is significantly different uh, from the uh, current research focus where we are trying to protect uh, our Im important environmental assets uh, such as uh, wildlife, fish and forests because uh, in this domain there is an attacker who attacks uh, repeatedly. So they come into, like for example in the wildlife uh, poaching domain there is a poacher who comes into the forest and repeatedly uh, lays snares. Um, and this uh, problem uh, that we are trying to address of the adversary coming into the forest repeatedly, uh, we call this green security games and this is uh, in fact inspired by uh, uh, real world challenges uh, faced by rangers uh, daily uh, while trying to use their limited security resources uh, to protect our important environmental assets. And uh, in fact, we have been collaborating with people at Malaysia, Indonesia, and Uganda and trying to learn more about the challenges faced by them. And so it is more uh, than just uh, limited petroleum resources in terms of the challenges that we face. We have imperfect observations uh, as one of the most important challenges uh, because uh, uh, the rangers uh, can only observe data uh, where they go, so there is bias in the data set and they also don't get to observe all the data at all the places they go uh, because the detection probability is not uh, perfect. So there is imperfection in the observations and we have to deal with that. Um, we also need to consider important uh, terrain information, uh, seasonal patterns and so on. Um, but even before we come uh, to this uh, real world data, even before we get the real world data, uh, we need to uh, develop models and show the validity of the models uh, in reasonable uh, uh, simulations of real world experiments so as to convince uh, the security uh, authorities uh, to use our decision aids. And to that end, uh, our first key contribution of this talk that we'll go over is developing these reasonable online game simulations of such real world situations and conducting human subject experiments and collecting a lot of data uh, in order to test our models. The second contribution uh, is developing the models uh, and we have come up with uh, several adaptive human adversary models for such repeated game settings where the adversary is continuously adapting over time to our strategies. And the third key contribution is uh, finally when we get the real world data, evaluating our models on the real world data and testing the performance of such models. So this is the uh, outline of our talk. I'll go over the first uh, bullet point, which is online game simulations and human subject experiments. And Ben will go uh, more into depth about the real world data that we have recently acquired and the human behavior models uh, that we have tested uh, on that real world data. Um, so as I was uh, mentioning earlier, um, it is important to partner with uh, security agencies who uh, want to work with us on the field, but uh, we want to increase their buy-in first. I mean, we need to convince them that our models uh, really work. Uh, and uh, so um, there are several um, uh, challenges to doing that. Uh, uh, one of the key challenges um, is that uh, often security agencies are interested uh, uh, but they're hesitant because uh, they may think that our models uh, may not work uh, in their specific scenarios and so we develop these uh, game simulations uh, so um, reasonable game simulations uh, of that real world scenario and so we did uh, one such thing where we went uh, uh, in partnership with the Wi uh, World Wildlife Fund WWF uh, to Indonesia um, and we conducted some experiments there. Uh, we developed uh, a computer game simulation of the uh, wildlife poaching scenario and uh, we asked uh, the um, uh, authorities there to play as poachers uh, in our game while we acted as the defender. Uh, we also had board games where they were divided into two groups where they played both as defender uh, and the adversary but I'll focus more on the computer game simulation where the uh, security uh, people from the security agencies played act as, as the adversary. 
So uh, this is a view of the uh, game simulation. So this uh, shows a view of the Queen Elizabeth National Park uh, in Uganda with uh, animals spread around the park. What the heat map uh, on this um, uh, Google Maps view shows is the defender's patrolling strategy uh, at a given point in time. So a highly reddish region means that there is a high probability that a ranger will be present in that area, uh, while a highly greenish region means that there is a less probability that a ranger will be present in that area. And uh, in red circles uh, is the uh, poacher uh, and the animals. So as uh, the poacher that the player who is acting as the poacher moves uh, throughout the park, uh, he gets to see various uh, features of each of the targets. For example, what is the reward that he will get uh, if he is successful at a particular target? What is the penalty uh, he will incur if he gets caught at a particular target? And with what probability the, probability the defender is covering that particular target? And then he gets to make a decision. Uh, Let's say he decides to attack at this um, the bottom leftmost uh, cell and he succeeds. So we give them feedback that, okay, you have succeeded uh, or else uh, if they uh, fail, uh, then they get caught and we give them uh, information that you got caught. And what we did in Indonesia with the uh, security experts is that uh, we, there were 30 of them, um, we asked them uh, to play one round of the game where initially we didn't have a behavioral model learned because we didn't have any data. So we deployed uh, a baseline game theoretic strategy called Maximin. And then once, we, once they played, once the 30 people played the first round of the game, we collected that data, learned the model, and then redeployed our strategy. So essentially, in the second round, this heat map that you see changed. And they attacked again. And this went on for several rounds. And uh, what I'm uh, yeah, and this went on for several rounds and we measured um, how good we are doing in terms of uh, the utility of the defender. And so this shows uh, some images uh, from that workshop that we conducted in Indonesia with WWF, <coughs> showing them uh, playing the game. So I won't go into uh, the detail details uh, of the model uh, uh, that we tested there, but what I'm showing here is the result of uh, 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 of the experiment that we conducted along x-axis is the defender's utility, along y, uh, sorry, along x-axis are the number of rounds and along y-axis is the defender utility. So as you can see that, that with respect to a baseline model such as Maximin, we are doing pretty well in terms of the utility. Um, the primary reason for that is that this uh, sorts of models that we developed uh, uh, adapts based on uh, where they have attacked in the past uh, and so it does pretty well. Uh, however, as I mentioned that there are uh, challenges in terms of the real world um, applications of these models because as you can see this was a very simplified abstraction uh, based on which we developed these models and so Ben will go into more depth uh, about the real world data and its challenges. So yeah, so for this next part of the talk, I'll go into um, the real data, um, the capture model we, do, we developed to, um, to handle some of these challenges, and also some of the experimental results as well. So, um, so we, we focused on the Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda, and we graciously received um, data from 1999 to 2016 from the Wildlife Conservation Society and the Uganda Wildlife Authority. And this data contains um, ranger observations when they went on patrol. In addition to that, it also contains domain features such as habitat information, such as forests or you know dense marshlands, etc. And also information about like um, slope and other you know difficult to navigate features. <laughs> um, so the real world data we collected um, that was collected by the rangers, um, they're collected when they're on patrol, and it consists of attack observations such as they found any snares, they found any animal carcasses, post or otherwise, and also if they found any signs of human illegal activity such as the poachers themselves or litter. And then this data is collected, and then once they return from patrol, it's aggregated at the base camp and analyzed by a patrol analyst that will use that data to generate um, for future patrols. And then this process will repeat. So the challenges involved, um, Deborah went into briefly, was that there's this concept of missing poaching data. So let's say we have a ranger that's patrolling, and there's limited patrolling resources. So let's say the, the ranger manages to patrol this area and, and finds a snare. That's great. However, we don't know what happened in the other areas that weren't patrolled. As such, that introduces um, data bias that's difficult to handle by machine learning um, techniques without accounting for it. In addition, 
um, there are imperfect observations. Even though they patrolled there, it's possible that even though there's an attack as well, they might not have seen it, and that's due to like um, trying to find a wire snare and dense brush and, uh, and other challenges. So I'm going to briefly go over the capture model. So this is a two-tiered model where the first tier kind of answers the question, um, where will poachers going to attack? And this basically generates the probability of attack at any given point. And then based on that, um, it, we can an ask another question, where will I actually see attacks? Based on where there are attacks and based on how likely I am to observe them, what's the probability that I'll observe an attack? So this goes on for multiple time steps where a time step can consist of months or even seasons. And however, the attack prediction um, itself is impossible to observe because we only have observations. We don't actually know where we haven't patrolled and we don't actually know with what frequency um, places are being attacked. However, we can use data to um, help us estimate this using expectation maximization and um, maximum likelihood estimation. So that is, is fed, in, fed into the model learning aspect. And then once that's learned, um, we can then do this for future time steps. And the, um, the model we learned for past time steps can then be used to, to learn um, the model for future time steps as well. And this can continue as well for as many time steps as we need. So I'll briefly go over some experimental results. So on here, um, this shows some prediction accuracy results from June to August of 2015. It's basically um, a dry season. And the y-axis shows the area under the ROC curve. Higher numbers are better. And then on the x-axis, we have um, various behavior models. Capture being our two-tiered model. And then the other four models correspond to um, two security game models, QR and SQR, which are one-tier models as well that just consider attack probability, and similarly um, being one-tier models, logistic regression support vector machines. And as you can see, by, by um, handling the fact that we can't observe, um, and, but by treating the two predictions as separate distributions, we can, base, we can better f fit the data. And here's a quick prediction example. This outlined in Queen Elizabeth National Park. And the, here's a heat map that shows basically the attack predictions. Darker areas of red should correspond to um, areas of higher attack probability, and lighter areas correspond to the lower areas of attack probability. So just to summarize briefly, um, a go a goal of the, the, the first aspect of this work was to try to convince security agencies that human behavior modeling can be useful towards um, helping to improve patrols against um, poachers. And to, to that end, we developed online simulations of real problems, and also conducted human subject experiments. So that way, it wasn't just you know purely simulation. However, it's crucial that we use real-world data because ultimately, that's what we're going to have to val evaluate our models on and what it's going to be used against in learning on. However, in order to do that, you have to address the unique challenges that are presented by that. And Capture um, looks to address some of those um, challenges by addressing them to imperfect observations. And uh, thank you for your attention. Time for a quick question or two. Yes. The model and the predictions. How are you validating those? Are you selecting data in the field? So the, the data was collected by um, the rangers in, 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 in the Queen Elizabeth National Park. And um, to, to learn the models, we use. Um, Basically, for right now we use some um, four years of, of seasonal, past seasonal data, and then we test on a, a fifth year of seasonal data. And then this continues for training windows, basically, and going all the way back from, you know, like 2000, for instance, up to 2015. So, so right now, um, we're still in the process of, like, um, improving the model and and iterating with them to kind of get feedback on our predictions, like, oh, well, here the, there's predictions, but we can't actually go here, so we'll incorporate various domain knowledge to, to, into the model to handle that. Um, are you will incorporate uh, different types of observations in terms of human activity. So uh, if a control group interacts or encounters a, a suspect, that control inherently ends because they have to go back to Right, right. But with a snare, that control doesn't end. Like you can still continue to pick up more snares and all that kind of stuff. Have 
you guys taken a look at or distinguishing between those types of observations and distinguishing how the game works in those scenarios? So right now we've focused mostly on um, animal co commercial, not commercial poaching, but those are divided into you know distinct categories and everything. But that would be interesting to look at to see like what ha what um, the predictions look like. What if you're trying to directly catch poachers and not just look for snares or signs of um, poached animals? Any other quick questions? Okay.